Let's go to uh, Romans. Notice the, the study heading is called the Romans creation. I wanted to do a little study on creation this year. And uh, so I decided instead of go to Genesis, I would go to Romans and talk a little bit about it. If you want to know a lot about creation, you can go to our website, doctrinalstudies.com, and you probably can get more than your heart would desire. But <clears throat> uh, notice that our, our main passage, our, what we call our primary passage for our study is going to come from Romans 8, 18 through 27. So between now and next week, kind of read that. I'm, I'm going to deal with verse 18, and 18, I'm actually going to read through 22 because they go together. And notice my subject today is creation's suffering. And I don't know that people think about that, that the God's creation is suffering. So here's verse 18, for I consider that the suffering of this present time, and, and, and I'm only going to deal with one of several, right? Uh, my main study, I'll talk about them, but my main study is going to be on the su creation suffering. But he's going to talk about um, the suffering in the present time, which is the time in which you and I live. Uh, for I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worth sufferings. No, that's plural. And if you read from 18 to the end of the chapter, it'll make sense to you. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us, church age believers. For the ancient, for the anxious longing, anxious longing of the creation, see that's what he's talking about in this section, waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God, that's us in our resurrection bodies. For the creation was subjected to futility, in other words, it had a starting point someplace, and has moved to the present time. Are you with me? See, I think it's interesting that he called it the present time, which means there has to be a past and a future. And he's, and he's just identified it in the past. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself also would be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. It will not be, it will not be released from its bondage of corruption until the end of the first resurrection series. For we know the whole creation, that's interesting, the whole creation, if you want to know what the whole creation is, then you, you study the six days, right, of creation. Six days of creation is the whole creation. For we know the whole creation groans and suffers, plural, the pains of child's birth, childbirth together until now. See, it refers to a starting point. Notice the word creation. Let's go back before we have a word of prayer. The idea of suffering of the present time is how it's introduced. And look at verse 19. Uh, it identifies us in, in verse, at the end of verse 18, the glory that is to be revealed uh, to us, it, to the glory that, in other words, it will be done through us. Uh, and the sons of God in verse 19, and then verse 20, creation, verse 21, creation, and then verse 22, creation. Okay? Also, when you study this passage, 
uh, and I'm talking about the greater passage, 18 through 27. You're going to do that before you come back next time. Pay attention to the word groans. Pay attention to the word groans because it's going to be mentioned three times for three different segments of sufferings of the present time. So pay attention. By now you know when you're reading, you're looking for markers, aren't you? You know, main ideas that are being restated, repetitious teaching. So this is going to, I, I hope, be an interesting study for you. Many of you have been with me so through so many of the, of the teachings on uh, creation that this will give you a different look at it, uh, a historical look, um, a biblical historical look to it, and, and kind of set it into uh, biblical history. Where, where it came from, how it works now, where it's headed. And so you'll get a good pa panoramic view of that uh, is my hope. Okay? So we're looking at verse 18. Um, that's our primary uh, look tonight is verse 18. Uh, and after a word of prayer, we'll come and we'll talk about four things, five, I guess, five aspects of creation suffering in this present time. Okay? Let's pray. I gave you a moment of silence as a believer priest, a classroom etiquette. For me, that means prepare your priesthood for the study of the Word of God. You're under the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He's the John 14, 15, and 16, that great passage on how he teaches us and what he teaches us and puts in our soul is there for recall on a split second of time under his ministry. Uh, he will recall it. Uh, he will help you exercise it out into your life in tough decisions as well as easy ones. I say often that the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. The word is spiritual. That means the Holy Spirit. That's how you're spiritual. You could read, uh, for example, 1 Corinthians 2, 14 through 3, 1 in your private time to know that principle. And the Holy Spirit dwells in you. He's a great teacher. You can't study it in carnality. You can't exercise it in carnality, in the flesh. How do I know I'm in carnality or the flesh? Well, personal sin, mental attitude sin, sins of the tongue and avert sins. What should I do? Confess them in silence through your priesthood to the Father? In the name of Christ. And what's the promise to me? Well, he says, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you. And that bring, restores you to fellowship under the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We call it sanctification. The ministry of sanctification out of the Christian's life. So I give you a moment to examine your life in regard to those, at least those three categories of sin and make your confession in silence. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful today for these that have come our way by automobile and the Internet. And we pray, Father, for both groups that are attending this study to use the classroom etiquette so that the Holy Spirit can minister the truth and they can maximize this hour of study with us. It's one thing to get to that hour. It's the other thing to maximize it so that the Holy Spirit of God can teach us truth that will set us free from the cosmic system of lies. And so, Father, I pray that would be what we're interested in today through the study of the Word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we've introduced our primary passage that we're going to look at. That's 18 through 27. Then we'll see where we go from there. Uh, with it, uh, Paul introduces this section about he opens up with the sufferings of the present time and he begins with the creation. And then he's going to move to other topics. And you will know those topics by you studying the word groans. Right? He's going to talk about it three times and he's going to set up three different ideas of it. And we'll look at that. Uh, in verse 19, he talks about the creation of the earth in human terms. He says, for the anxious, the anxious longing. 
of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing. I don't know if we've thought about a piece of ground that way, a piece of earth, even a section of it. I don't know if we think of it that way, but he's trying to personalize it, isn't he? Because it is suffering, and he's trying to make us realize that creation is going to suffer in a similar way that we do. Listen to me. For the same reason. For the same reason. And so he talks about creation in verse, what, 20, 21, 22, didn't he? He said, listen, let, let, let me focus a moment on creation. The creation suffering of this present time is described in our passage as the groaning of childbirth. In verse 22, for we know the whole creation. The word ho is the word pas on your paper, the Greek word. And he is the definite article of the word creation. And it groans, present active indicative, and it will until, that, until the suffering is removed. And he tells you when it's, what is connected to. He tells you what's connected to its removing, and it's us. We have a major play in when this suffering is going to be changed. Um, we know the whole creation groans and suffers the pain of childbirth together. What do you mean by together? The whole creation together. We're talking about day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, and day six. It's all been affected. The whole creation has been affected by something in the same way that we've been affected. Now, he's going to tell you that when he gets to the second groan and then the third groan in this passage. And so he says, the whole creation groans and suffers the pain of childbirth together until now. And the truth of the matter is that they suffer together with us. Now the question becomes from when to now, because he says until now, right? Until now. So this until is a pretty big point in this whole idea of suffering. Historically, we got this word until now. Well, what's about to now that's going to help them out, right? Until now. And the now is the church age. And that suffering is all connected this is kind of like with the, the demons. Every time they met Christ, they went, oh, wow. Is it, is, it, is it now? And he says, well, we're close. We're close to it. And that's kind of what we got here until now. So there was, what is the starting point? What is the cause point? When did this begin that's going on, has been going on from then till now, but because of now, which is, the Messiah, the coming of the Messiah, everything has changed. You understand? In other words, the, the creation is still under groaning. It's still under suffering. But when the Messiah comes, a whole new day is coming, has been introduced to human history. And that's the point. And the when is what I'm going to answer for you today. Okay? In these five points, we will get that. Point number one, notice that Paul opens the subject with what he has personally learned. Sometimes this is missed. Notice that Paul opens this subject with what he has personally learned and is now wanting to share with the Gentile church. 
But here's what you don't see unless you begin to have eyes to see things. You know, you've already been taught to look for markers. So, you know, now you've, you've begun to have different viewpoints or ideas. Now, here's what we got going. Notice the word for, for I consider, for I consider. That's how, I, that's how uh, verse 18 opened, right? Well, look, that little for sometimes is just, but it's a conjunction. I call a conjunction a trailer hitch. It's a trailer hitch. Okay? It's a trailer hitch. Now, you have to ask yourself why. What's the reason? For I consider. And here's, here's the idea. I want you to go back and look at verse 17. Because this word for gives the reason for what he's about to say. The connection. This is a connective link. Look at verse 17. And if children heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Are you with me? Now, look at verse 18. Uh, in verse 17, the word suffer and glorified. See those two words? All right, look at verse 18. Look at the word, look for the word suffering and glory. See that? Now, the word for here is that connective link to this statement. If indeed we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him, for I considered. In other words, this is his going to be his reasoning out how we and the suffering of creation are connected to the coming of Christ. Okay? Now you know what I do all day long. Okay? So, so what, what you have is something like this, and I wrote it out for you. What you have is something like this. Look down below, below verse, that part 17. For this reason. Do you see? That's, the, that's what he means. For this reason, which is the last part of verse 17. And that's why this conjunction is a trailer hitch. It's connecting two things. For this reason, which is indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. See, the coming of Christ, death on the cross, burial, resurrection, ascension and session has put all of this into motion. For this reason, I considered. I considered. Now, logizomai, the word considered, is an interesting word. It's used quite a bit. It's a present middle indicative, but the part, part I want you to understand, this is a word that means to have, have calculated thinking. Calculated. I have put this with this, and that equals that, and that equals this, and this, and that, and, and here's the conclusion. It's a calculated thinking. And that's what he's going to do from verses 18 through the end of the chapter. It's exactly what he's going to do. And it's based off of what he's previously said and off from one line of what he has previously said in chapter 8. Are you with me? <laughs> All right. Let's go to Philippians 4 a moment. Philippians 4, Ephesians, Philippians 4. We're going to look at verse 8 and 9. Finally, my brethren, whatever is true, what is honorable, what is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is good repute, if there is any excellent and if anything worthy, 
let's say worthy of praise let your mind dwell on these things let your mind dwell on these things see that's what I'm after with you calculated thinking calculated thinking let your mind dwell on these things these things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. Let your mind dwell on these things. Calculated thinking. And he tells you, here's what I want you to think of. Here's what I want you, I want your mind to dwell on. Look, look all the different things here. Now, con context would be really important because you have to study the book and the chapter four. He's summa summarizing. But Whatever is true and whatever is honorable and right and pure and lovely and of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on it. And he gave you a little bit to think about. And you have calculated thinking there. See the list? He calls them excellence. Or, or virtues of the Christian life, the virtues, virtue, this virtuous living. Let your mind dwell on these things. Th these are the things that you should, this, this is calculated thinking that should bring out proper decisions in your life and behavior or whatever, the way you view your life, the way you view life in general, the way, way whatever's going on. It's just an interesting word, lokizomai, is the word. It's just kind of interesting, okay? Calculated thinking. He says, for this reason, I considered that the sufferings, plural, and I gave you the word, uh, which is an interesting word because it tells you that word, pathomai, is an interesting word because it's a sacrificial word. It's a word connected to the blood of Christ. It's connected to the atonement of sin, which is an interesting word for this. It's not always the same word used for this. He has connected you why Christ came, why the earth is, listen, why, here's why this word is used, because the earth is under suffering because of Adam's sin, and the only way that Adam's sin can be removed is for Christ to die on a cross, be buried and raised from the dead, right? That's why this word is used. The suffering of the creation is the same as the suffering of mankind under an Adam's sin can only be, can o Adam's sin can only be removed, whether from man or the whole creation. Is man part of the whole creation? Yes. Yeah, day six. See, he's lumped it all together. I mean, I don't know who's ever even thought of that before, except Paul. Paul and his calculated things put all this together. Let's see, what else? That the suffering of this present time, which is Messianic age, right? We're in the Messianic period. We're under the new covenant. And he lays that out for you. Church age. Listen, listen to Philippians 129. Not on your paper. Should be, but it's not. Philippians 129. We, we've, I'm going to just give you the tail end of it. We, that... In Christ, we have been, it has been granted to us not only to believe, but to suffer for his namesake. Right? That's a powerful idea. And here it is in this present time. We live in this period of time. He says, for this reason, that the suffering, uh, for this reason, that the sufferings, of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. In, in, in other words, listen, the fact that Christ came and saved you is only, is only the beginning of what Christ has got in store for you. Just think about that. I mean, we're going all the way to the new heaven and new earth with him. I mean, what, what you got going for you right now is just a small piece of the action. It's called living on earth. That's just a small piece of the action of what it means to be in Christ. Just a small piece of the action. Now, it's a big piece of the action because we're alive. Uh, we're alive on the earth. 
but just a small piece of what God has in store for your life. Because one day you're going to die. And listen, you're going to move into a bigger piece of action with him than you had on earth. Your days are only going to get better. Praise God. The worst days that you'll ever have is right here. And in Christ, he makes those days easier to live with. In Christ, he makes them easier. Listen, when you die, ah, da, 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 da. anyhow, point number two, the cause of the suffering of the creation, the whole creation, it includes us. Throughout all of human history is due to the curse associated with Adam's sin. Now, I want you to get this. I don't want you to miss this one. Let's open your Bibles. Put your eyes on this. Genesis, first book in the Bible. Genesis, third chapter. And here's where it is. Now, third chapter. Verse 17, 18, 19. Now, let's go back for a moment. Hold your place. Let's go back to the second chapter, verse 17. This is where it all starts. 2, two seventeen. Uh, go to 3 and then hold your place. And then go to chapter 2. I should have said that to start with. Uh, but 2.17. Uh, 2, 2.17. Let's start with 2.17. Yeah, because this is where it begins. But from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it, you shall surely die or die and you will die. Are you with me? That's where it begins. Who was that? Who, who was talking? God, the Lord God. And who was he talking to? Adam. All right. Now, when we go to the third chapter. Adam ate, right? Adam ate. Verse 17. Then to Adam he said, see, between 217 and 317, Adam ate. <laughs> okay? Then Adam said, or then, then to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat from it, cursed is the what? There's where it started. Cursed is the ground. That's earth. Because of you, cursed is the ground because of whom? Who's the you? Adam. Adam. That's singular. Now watch the sign that's going to be throughout history that the curse is, that the earth is cursed because of Adam's sin, right? This is the curse. This is not because he, we've got, we got sin and death out of 217. Now we've got the earth cursed and have to live off from the earth, cursed earth the rest of our life. We have to earn a living off a cursed earth. We have to live in an environment off a cursed earth. You understand? Now, there are signs. There are personal signs that, as big as the rainbow that can tell you this. In toil, that's hard work. In toil, you shall eat, shall eat of it all the days of your life. And some of them are all. all right? Now, boy, I'll tell you, as an old farm boy, I understand this. I mean, I understand. We, we got our whole living out of the earth. And, boy, we understood but anyhow, both thorns and thistles, 
it shall grow for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field. All right. So number one, the sign to you that the earth is suffering, cursed and suffering, is toiling because, buddy, you got to work to get something out of it. Right? And, of course, that carries over to whether, no matter what job you got. Okay. But we're talking about why the earth is, what situation the earth is in. Now, here's a second sign. See, the first one was 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 to who man or the earth in toil say that's the man isn't it because and it's a it's a it's a sign to him the earth is cursed now here's the second one by the sweat of your brow or the sweat of your face perspiration right we used to call it sweat by the, by the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. Because from it you were taken. You know where that's found? Genesis 2-7. And you know what was made out of the ground? The body, not the soul. The soul was made out of God. Only the body goes back to the dust of the earth. Because from it you were taken, so dust, you are dust, and to dust you shall return. That's why we, we put people in the ground, funerals. You see that? So, so Adam sinned in 2.17. The ground was cursed and man connected to it because we are earthlings. Earthlings? Earthens? Er, did I say it right the first time? Earthlings? All right, well, who know? I didn't come from the moon. I came from a place close to it, though, but I didn't come from it. All right. So we're in a present period. Agreed? Where the, where the, Earth is still struggling, still suffering, and groaning. Agreed? Where did, and how long has that been? Whew. I don't know. We didn't keep time until he sinned, and I don't know. You know what I mean? I, I couldn't begin to tell you. But the earth didn't get cursed until Adam sinned. Now, it's important for you to remember because a lot of stuff went on in chapter 1 of Genesis. But the ground being cursed didn't begin until Adam ate of that tree. Are you with me? And the creation that came up to that point is the one that's under, under suffering. If you want to know more about what it was like before that, then you have to go to my, you have to go to the web and, and pick down, pick up one of my, Genesis studies, and I can tell you about all that there. So, enter point two. The cause of the suffering of creation throughout human history is due to the curse associated with Adam's sin. Do you, do you understand that? I mean, look, I don't care if you agree with it or not. Do you understand it? Because that's the first point, is to understand it. Do you understand that? I, my job is not to make you believe. My job is to give, to inform you so that you can believe. Because you're not going to get this out of science. You might have, you might have 50 years ago, but you're not today. This is not evolution. Jeez, I'm so glad I, I, I went through my education when I did. I'm so happy for that. We had absolutely sense. Now, here's one of the things you missed when I went with you through Genesis. Here are three, here are three things you missed when I went through Genesis, the third chapter, 17 through 19. So I wrote them down for you. 
because I'm trying to teach you that when you study the Bible, study it. Most of the time, you only read it. And there's a difference between reading it and studying it, right? You, you know that if you got anywhere in school, didn't you? I'd go home and study it, and I'd go back, and they'd give me a test, and I'd go like, whoo, I, I read it. I mean, I would go home and read it. Then she would give me a pop test, and I'd go like, whoa, I better study the next time, and I'd just read it. Because she would say, did you read it? Children, did you read your assignment? Everybody said, yes. She said, well, take out a pencil and paper. And I went, I am, I am dead. <coughs> that was a wonderful teacher because she taught me to study, not just to read. <laughs> and I'm ever thankful for Phyllis Breening. <laughs> what a, a teacher who taught eight grades in one school room. It was the best education I could have ever gotten. Repetitive teaching of eight grades. <laughs> Nobody left that school without, not, without knowing those eight grades. Well, anyhow, here are the three things because, I mean, who pays attention to that word except you? You know why you pay attention to it? It's a marker, right? Listen to this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reread. Genesis 3, 17 through 19. Then to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil, you shall eat all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles, it will grow for you. And you will eat the plants of the fields. By the sweat of your face, you will eat bread. Bread. I never, listen, we did a lot of farming on the ground. I never planted uh, corn and got bread. I didn't, get, I didn't even get cornbread. <laughs> eh, see? You had to grind that and do a whole lot of stuff with it before it came bread, didn't it? That's interesting. <laughs> Till you return to the ground because, see, the three times, those are three markers. First reason, second reason, third reason. Okay? You will pay attention to that stuff when you read it. Okay? There's a difference between reading and studying, isn't there? See, because my whole point to you was, what is the reason, right? What is the reason? Genesis gave you three reasons right there. You used it with the word because, because Kai in the Hebrew carries that idea. For those who love Hebrew. Point number three. Paul is explaining that there is a past and a future as well as a present time of creation suffering because of the curse of Adam's sin. And he tells you that the present time, listen, he tells you that the present time in which you now live is not worthy to be compared with the glory to be revealed to you. This is nothing. Now, some people like that, and other people go like, well, I've had a pretty good life, and other people said, well, I can't say I've had a good life, but it's been okay. <laughs> Listen, once you meet Christ, your life is good. It's all good. All things work together for good now, not, 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 not like it was in the old day. It's a new day. But I love what he says, not worthy. The present time, even though it is... The, we live in the coming of the day of Christ. What you have and what you have found in Christ is not worthy to be compared with the glory that's going to be revealed to you. Boy, is that not a piece of cake hanging out there for you? Or a piece of something over there, I don't know. For me, just a good piece of pie would do it for me. I'm a pie guy. So let's review. The past time of suffering of creation was from the antediluvian period. The antediluvian period goes from added to Noah's flood. And a whole civilization gets wiped out except for those on the boat. Agreed? Noah's boat.
It was amazing to me. You can teach Noah the story of Noah to adults, and they go, hey, pff, pff, uh, yeah, right. My professors all told me it was a myth, mythology study. Then I knew I wasn't there for knowledge. I was there for a degree. But you know, you can sit in a room with little kids. You can tell them the story of Noah. It's the darndest thing I ever saw. And they remember it. And uh, I quiz my little grandkids, the little ones, the older ones, of course, can't. They're beyond that stage. But my little four-year-old, my little two-year-old, I can talk about, anybody know about Jonah's Ark? They get you right away. Well, he had a boat. Yeah, that was in the ark. Second uh, Peter. I want you to go to Second Peter with me. We'll move on through this. Second Peter. Second Peter. You know what I love about little children? Is once you catch their attention, they really focus. And that they just absorb information like it's unbelievable. But you, you got to catch them at that moment, right? Because they don't last long. But boy, that's the most amazing thing to me. I'm in 2 Peter, 3rd chapter. 2 Peter, 3rd chapter. You know, in the front of your Bible, you have an index that tells you what page even to look for. Um, I'm in the third chapter, and I want to show you this in verses 4 through 6. If you have a study Bible, mine says the, the, the coming day of the Lord. And it starts in verse 3, but I want to, I want to drop down to 4. Where is the promise of his coming? For even since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of the water and by the water and through which the world at that time was destroyed with a flood of water. Now we've gone from creation to Noah's flood. That's as, and that takes me to my period that I'm talking about. The present period is found in verse 7. But the present heaven and earth, notice how that's described. Now, the present heaven and earth, and we know it's still under the suffering. Now, the present heaven and earth, by his word, are being preserved for fire. See, that's what's coming. It's going to renovate, it's going to renovate the earth the, for fire kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. Okay? And then there's a future. And so... I, I put this. Now, before, before I leave the antediluvian in the present world, the rainbow, you know what the rainbow is to tell us? What's the rainbow for? I mean, little kids love this rainbow, and what a great lesson is every time a rainbow comes out, everybody says, oh, look at the rainbow. Oh, there's a double rainbow. Oh, yeah. I say, yeah, but you know why it's there? Okay. What wonderful little children you are. Thank you. That's what. The, so the rainbow, and God stuck it, and he tells you why he stuck it up there. He stuck it up there to tell you that he's a covenant God, that I honor my word. What I tell you, I will honor. Now, that's going to be in th until the fire comes. So the f And so there's the future. And you can read about I gave you the scripture. Is that later you can look it up in Genesis 9 and go through that whole thing about the rainbow because you need to teach your children or grandchildren that. It's a sign of the covenant uh, and that God is faithful. That's what I teach them. I said, you know what that rainbow? That rainbow, my, my, my little children, that rainbow tells you that God is true to his word. God is faithful. And that it helps me with the essence. I'm able to go through, you know, because it's part of, 
part of who he is, isn't it? That he's truthful. And so it, it helps me uh, in teaching them uh, the essence of God, my little, my little children. Uh, and, then, and then with the future suffering of creation, notice under there the future is the, is the millennium. So in the post-Diluvian period, which you and I live in, we go from the coming of Christ all the way to the second coming. We come, well, actually from Noah's flood, we enter the post-Diluvian after the flood is what that means. And we go to um, the second coming of Christ. That's what we saw in 2 Peter 3. Then the future suffering of the creation will be the millennial age. That goes from uh, the second coming of Christ to the new heavens and the new earth. Uh, and this is covered uh, from verse 9 on. Uh, in verse 8, uh, he says, But do not this is one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years in one day. Then he says, the Lord is not slow. See, see, when we just spend through a thousand years, right, in a day. I mean, the only way you can do that, I guess, is go to the moon. <laughs> Other than the Bible. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any perish, but all come to repentance. Say, what a wonderful what a, a, a wonderful thing to remind us about while we're on earth. Our mission is to share the gospel with other people. And, and let me tell you why it's important to share the gospel with all the people, even the people you think don't want to hear it. Listen, they need to hear it because that word will one day stand and judge them. So sometimes you give the gospel to people because they will hear and believe it, and for other people, they will hear it and reject it. And for one, he, he enters salvation, and for the other, he, he, is, he is locked into condemnation. You understand what I mean? And that will come back. And so I, I always think that's a, it's a positive either way for you for the Holy Spirit to deal with them because it's either come into the kingdom and no more judgment, no more condemnation, or to remain where you are and remain in condemnation and you have no idea how bad this is going to get. So, the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements, just think of this, the elements of the heavens and the earth are going to be changed. Will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its work will be burnt up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought we be to be in holy conduct and godliness as we look forward to the hastening and coming of the day of the Lord on account of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat? But according to his promise, we are looking for a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. See, that's the future. So we, in this one passage of of 2 Peter 3, we have seen the whole shooting match, haven't we? We, we saw the whole, the whole thing as it's laid out there, the whole picture. Mm -hmm. In Romans 8, 21, oh, during the millennial period, I want you to, I want you, I want you to see that, I, see during the millennial period, see I want you to circle Isaiah 65, 25. And then I want you to, and, and then I, this is where the, this is where in the millennium where the wolf and the lamb will graze together and the ox and the lion will, will graze together and no evil or harm will come on them. Listen to me now. Listen to me really close. There is another thing said in that passage that comes out of the garden sin of Adam that will not change and is connected to an animal. The serpent, you remember the serpent? You remember the, Adam's curse was pronounced upon him? You know what it was? 
Well, that, that, that. Oh, on his belly. He's got to go on his belly. Huh? He, he's, all of his, uh, the rest of it, he's got to go on his belly, and he's got to do what? He's got to eat something. Yeah, dust. Eat dust. In this millennial passage, in this millennial passage of Isaiah 65, 25, it says the lamb, it says here, here we have the lamb and the, and the what, the wolf, and we have the lion and the ox, no harm or evil. And then it comes back and it says the serpent, the serpent still eat dust. How about that? And, and listen, during the millennium, where is Satan? He's pinned up. And so we got a snake still go on his belly eating dust as a symbol, a sign. I just thought, I just found that to be interesting. Um, but here's the one I want you to write down because this is the one most people are familiar with. They're not familiar as much with Isaiah 65, 25 as they are with Isaiah 11, 6 through 9. Yeah. Yeah, that's the passage that most of you would probably think of when you think of the millennial age and, and some changes being made. The the lion and the lamb. Well, that in that passage, yeah, then Isaiah 11, I think, where you'll find that. Um, point number four. Scientists refer to the curse of the curse of Adam's original sin upon the creation of earth as the second law of thermodynamics. And buddy, they got it right. Now, unfortunately, evolutionists get it wrong. But Dr. Morris in his book, Genesis Records, gives one of the most simple definitions for the average guy about the second law of thermodynamics. All things living and none living eventually wear out, run down, grow old, decay, and pass into dust. And, buddy, that is it. I mean, I mean, that's as good as it gets. Creation, listen to me, creation does not move from simplicity to complexity. That's what evolutionist says. The truth is a matter. It's just the opposite. It's just the opposite. It's just the opposite. And I'll tell you why. Because God created the heavens and the earth without tohu wabohu. Without tohu wabohu. That's without, without form and void. Man, that's not how he created it. Tohu wabohu. Formless and void. A waste and uninhabited land. You know where I got that? Genesis 1-2. But you know what you should read? You ought to read how God recovered that in, in the bigger story of Isaiah 45-18. You know, I have, I have had my hands full raising my kids and my grandkids, and now I got great-grandkids. No, I don't have great-grandkids yet. I don't have any of those. No. And, uh, well, my kids just taking their time about that. I said, how is it? Po well, anyhow. M one of the biggest tussles I've had with my kids is this e science and evolution is just so screwy. It's so screwy. And, it, and I've had my hands full just going like, look, let me go back and tell you how this whole thing works. They don't have, they don't have a picture of how this stuff really works. And they, you know. Point number five, the curse of Adam's original sin, listen to me, is an aging process. That's the second law of thermodynamics. The basic, the basic principle of that is everything is aging and decaying. I mean, you know that. How do you count a tree? The age of a tree or 
you know, I mean, I'm just telling you, it's just the way it is. See how difficult it is to hear the truth and believe it? See how difficult it is? It's difficult. I remember when I heard it the first time and I, I had been brainwashed and all that goofiness. I remember how difficult it was. I remember how difficult it was to believe there was really a God. I mean, let alone a creation. The curse of Adam's the, the curse of Adam's sin is the aging process, listen to me, which can be seen with the human eye. Well, why do you think people age? Say, well, everybody's got their opinion. And if you would change your diet, you wouldn't age so much. If you didn't this, listen, living it, listen, I tell you what I've seen with my naked eye. You live a tough life. You get into drugs. You get into stuff. You get into bad stuff. It'll age you in a heartbeat. I, I, when I was down there, I would see people I thought were 80 and they were 35 in the tension centers and places. I mean, but aging process with your own eyes, you can see the curse of, of Adam's sin upon the human being. And, and listen, the, you know what the aging process is? It's everywhere. Go out and cut a tree down. You'll see an aging process. It's, it's, it's in creation. I mean, just, you know, I just kid grew up with common sense. My people were all common sense people. Always common sense. I'd go to my grandfather who had to leave school in the eighth grade to go raise, help raise the rest of the family. And he was probably the smartest man I've ever known. To just eat up with common sense. I could bring him home math problems I couldn't solve when I was in college, and he'd go like, look, I can't get you what your teacher wants, but I get you the answer, son. And he always got me the answer, and I'd take it to the teacher and say, how'd you get it? And I'd say, well, here's my grandfather. And she went like, my goodness, I've never seen anything like that. And he could always get me the answer. I mean, he's just, he was just, just a wonderful guy. So listen, if you can see the rainbow, rainbow, you can see people aging, can't you? And you're like, well, where's that from? Well, everybody's got an opinion that don't make sense. But I'll tell you, the one that does is, is the curse of Adam's sin. The curse of Adam's sin. Listen to 2 Corinthians 4.16. Therefore, do not lose heart. When the outer man is decaying, because the inner man is being renewed day by day, there's it is. So don't lose heart just because you're aging. Why? It's a normal process. Not only are you are, but the whole creation is, right? The whole creation is. You're not the only person, and it's not just the humans. Your little puppy is, your little cat is, your fish is, your tree is, your flowers are, the grass is. The psalmist talks about it, doesn't he? Wither as the grass, we will wither. He tells us we will wither as the grass. James is going to talk about it. We will wither like the flower. We will wither like that. That's not a bad thing. It's just a different set of glory. There's nothing. Listen, listen. Babies cute. Little toddlers. School kids. Right? Teenagers. They bulk up, the boys, you know, my, my grandson, you know, turned 16. He hits the gym about every time it opens. Bulking up, looking good. He's got that, he's now getting that walk. <laughs> Played varsity last year, and he's got that varsity walk. He walks in a room, and he, I got it. A little swagger on him. And we just, you know, the old boys sit around, and we just chuckle, go like, I don't remember. I don't remember. Listen, they're all good, but they're all good. Listen, then the aged people go, I just hate to get old. Why would you hate something? You, there's nothing. Why not be glad? Why not be glad? Are you glad when a baby's born is healthy? Yes. Why not you? It's just a period of life. Why don't you embrace it? I love what he says. He said, when you get there, you're, listen, in Christ, it's all about glory. In Christ, it's all about glory. 
Don't look in the mirror and go like, oh, geez. I mean, look, if you want to count your wrinkles, it's okay. But then smile and go like, it's all good. And this, get a little swagger back in you, you know? You got that, you got a little swagger, get that swagger back. Don't let anybody take it from you. Lift up your eyes to the sky. Listen to this. Lift up your eye to the sky, then look to the earth beneath. For the sky will vanish like smoke, and the earth will wear out like a garment, and its inhabitants will die in like manner. But my salvation will be forever, and my righteousness will not wane. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I get fired up over that. All right, guys, thanks. Thank you. Let's close in prayer. Hi, Heavenly Father, how thankful we are for these who come with open ears and hearts to learn. It's not my place, Father, to make them believe it, but to rather give them enough to think about. And in the end, may the truth of the Word of God win victory in their soul. It did in mine. I mean, I can... I am so thankful. I am so thankful for it. The truth of the Word of God. There is so much gobbledygook out there today, Father. I'm thankful to have a Bible teaching church, congregation that allows me this privilege. And I pray those who have an extension of this through the internet would have the same deep appreciation. Well, we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.